Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the edge of the world. We have 21 students in your class. Miranda Atatahak. Shani Ignak Ignak Pogat. Ignak Palgat. Sorry. <laughs> Jason Midovic. He's not coming back. Another night out in the call. I put a word to my neck as I froze. My team really with it, get hit it, get with it. No limit when I get back under the road. No. These kids, they need an outlet to get involved in something besides this damn night culture. Sports. Who the hell are you to say what we need? <laughs> You want to come check out lacrosse Wednesday after school? Flyers won't work. You got to show respect there. You guys like sports, huh? I don't like to run. Come on, guys, let's turn down the suck and turn up the good. Now, are you with me? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 333. Out now in Australia in select cinemas is The Grizzlies, a sports drama that tells the true story of Inuit students in a small Arctic town whose lives are transformed when they are introduced to the sport of lacrosse. A film that is equal parts illuminating and inspiring without resorting to the usual cliches found in underdog sports movies, the Grizzlies also marks the feature directorial debut of Miranda de Poncier, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Miranda, I thank you very much for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. So the origins of The Grizzlies is fascinating to me. And essentially, it goes all the way back to a short film you made back in, I think it was, um, it was released in 2011 called Throat Song. Um, was that like the that project? Was that the first time you kind of traveled to the north and spent time with the Inuit communities there and kind of like a made base of operations for filmmaking? Well, actually, I had gone I had gone up to the Arctic for the first time because of the Grizzlies. So I was, you know, sent this ESPN news piece about this group of kids who were living in the a town with the highest suicide rate in North America and whose lives were transformed through sport. And so I got up to this indigenous community for the first time to get the life rights of those kids mm -hmm. to and, and make the movie. So I had gotten up there a couple of years before. And what happened was actually I was, I was producing the film initially and Graham Yost was writing and directing. And then he got busy on uh, justified um, a te television series. And he called and he said, De Poncier, I can't do it anymore. And he's like, but you know what? You should direct it. And I thought, what? He's crazy. I thought, I've never directed. I don't know if I could do it. And I thought, well, I'd gotten to know um, a woman named Stacey Adelick McDonald, who had been helping me in the North. She was a filmmaker. Um, she's Inuk, um, indigenous from the Arctic. And so she had been helping me in the early stages of development of the Grizzlies. And I sort of turned to her and I said, you know, Graham thinks I should direct, but I want to practice. Do you want to make a movie, right. <laughs> a short, and we can practice together because Stacy had been learning sort of video, but hadn't made a film and I, uh, hadn't produced a film and I had never directed. So although I'd been a producer for a long time. So the two of us ended up making that short film throat song as a kind of calling card and practice mm -hmm. for the Grizzlies. And then, and that crew actually, it was almost entirely indigenous Inuit crew who were local to uh, the town in the Arctic. We shot the short in and most of them had never even been on a, on a film set before. Like they really didn't know anything about filmmaking. So we had uh, a guy who was an electrician and we said, can you come be the gaffer? And, <laughs> and then that, there was the, with the local salon woman. We said, can you come and do hair on the movie set? And so we sort of gathered, um, regular folk who came and made that film with us and everybody had such an amazing experience and trained in such a great way that we ended up using a lot of that crew when we made the feature of the Grizzlies. A lot of the Grizzlies um, 
shows kind of like a culture shock that the main character has when he when he um goes there when you first go up to the north did you have that similar kind of culture shock yourself did you have to uh, like a um uh make yourself kind of like aware more of kind of like the traditions and the customs and such of the community uh beforehand or was it something you kind of learn as you kind of go along a hundred percent i mean it was it, it's both i'm from toronto which is a big city in the south um in canada i'm a white a white girl um so i had never spent time in uh, in an indigenous um or frankly had never been that far north in canada so it was a total culture shock in the beginning um and meeting the kids the the original kids who who the story is about also was a culture shock to me in in a kind of emotional way. I remember meeting uh, Adam, uh, who's one of the characters in the film for the first time, and he agreed to meet with me. And I had to, when I was asking him for his life rights, I spent a couple of days in his community. And at the end of us hanging out, he finally said, okay, he said, I'm a little reluctant to give you my life rights because I'm afraid of being reminded of what life was like before the Grizzlies program took place mm. and being reminded of the trauma that was in the community. And he said, but at the same time, I love the idea of making this film, you know, you making this film because I think if it can help other communities, I want to be a part of it. And he said, before the Grizzlies, I mean, before the Grizzlies, the real program started, um, he was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And then that lacrosse stick went into his hand and something in him profoundly changed immediately. Yeah. And he said he was 13 years old when that happened. So that was like, oh, this is not my experience. This is not my history. This is something profoundly different than the way I've grown up. And I know what Canadian life to be. So it was immediately apparent I needed to find Indigenous partners to make it. And then the journey, there's so much big learning that happened over the 10 years of making the film. But I'm grateful for the journey. Also, though, I think it made the film better because as I learned more and collaborated more with with Inuit partners, um, the film became more nuanced. I think what's important as well is that, as well as that, spirit of collaboration you were also kind of planting the seeds for like a filmmaking community to grow in that part of the world um you had audition workshops you had arctic <clears throat> excuse me audition workshops and like acting workshops as well uh you mentioned before you had different people in community take on different roles um what's it like now um in that part of, of the world in regards to filmmaking do you find now that there are younger filmmakers are people kind of like picking up cameras and like making kind of shorts and such it, it, what's what's the process been like in that regard yeah i mean i think the same as what's happening in your part of the world there's been a lot of conversations about the importance of of giving space to diverse voices um, to tell their stories and you know 10 years ago when i was first making this film um there weren't a lot of indigenous filmmakers not because there weren't a lot of talented people waiting in the wings or trying to get their stuff off the ground but there just wasn't the opportunity. Um, so a lot's been changing. Um, there's, there's, you know, we've got a long way to go, but I've met so many talented young indigenous people making this film in the process of making this film. And a number of the kids who worked on the Grizzlies have actually gone on to start making their own movies. Um, and I'm now also supporting some of them. I'm sort of stepping back into back into a producer position and helping support um, some young Indigenous filmmakers right now. So I, I think it's um, it's exciting. One of the things we did was in every single department during the shooting of the film, we made sure that um, there, there was someone training. There was a paid um, position for someone from the Arctic to learn a new skill. And, uh, and so, as I said, even from the short film, a lot of those um, young Indigenous um, people working on the movie have continued now to work on other movies and hone their crafts. So I think it's um, still a young um, sort of, uh, there, because there hasn't been opportunity, there just hasn't been the experience yet, but just seeing the growth of, of the, of the, 
sort of um, opportunity over the past 10 years has changed. And it's really exciting to see what's going to come down the pipe of young Indigenous filmmakers out of Canada. Amongst many things, the Grizzly says just the, just this spectacular scenery. You know, it's in shout out to your cinematographer, Gene Donat, for the great work you did there. Um, working in kind of like winter kind of locations, very kind of cold locations, what kind of um, uh, problems can arise in regards to that, in regards to film stock, et cetera? Do you find that um, working in those kind of conditions, conditions brought about problems in regards to, you know, technical issues? Well, it's funny, you know, um, cameras, I think, have come a long way. I remember I was shooting a movie in New York City a few years ago um, in Central Park, and we had a red camera and it kept freezing. It would get so cold that it would shut down and we'd have to take it into a basement of a church and like warm it up like a little baby um, to bring it back out again. So luckily we didn't have um, equipment breakdowns um, when we were shooting the Grizzlies. Uh, um, The cameras seemed to hold up, but we certainly had issues with just shooting in that kind of weather. There were some days that were 60 below Mm. and you can't la- you got to keep kind of moving and you've got to keep your actors moving. And, you know, if you've seen a, those, those people who've been on a film set, there's a lot of sitting around in between takes. So yeah. in this case, we had to kind of keep going. There was also the issue of light. So in the Arctic, um, in the summer, there's 24 hours of daylight. In the winter, there's 24 hours of, of darkness um, with no light. And so we needed both night and day um, in our movie and we shot in the spring. So we were sort of actually chasing the night and, and uh, we were losing it, you know, every inch of, of every day we were getting down to only having about three hours of, of night. Um, And, uh, and that was a challenge. And then just also kind of being in very precarious weather, um, being out on the ice and having to talk to um, Inuit hunters to make sure that the ice is going to hold because it was spring, which is a dangerous time to be out on ocean ice, um, especially when you've got 50 people and a a cast and a lot of equipment. (laughs) Um, So we had we had a seal hunting scene um, and we were sort of petrified and a couple of days later it rained and and uh, we wouldn't have been able to go out again but so there was a lot that you have to kind of be challenged by and think about when you're shooting in the arctic at the same time you can point the camera in any direction and it's absolutely gobsmackingly beautiful so that's the plus um i could have made the film a few years earlier in southern ontario closer to toronto um, and kind of faked the North. Um, but I just knew that there's a, there's a light and a feeling in mm. the Arctic that's unlike anywhere in the world. And I was like, I know it's going to cost more money and more time to do it up there, but we got to do it. Yeah, and you can definitely see it and feel it as well while watching the movie. So g- good on you for, for doing that and putting that extra uh, work in there. Um, you know, the, the role of sports that plays in this movie, you know, sports – uh, means many things. It can be unifying. It can be uplifting. It encourages exercise and teamwork and goal setting, etc. Um, I think the importance of um, sport, especially in Indigenous communities here in Australia, uh, I know for um, in Indigenous communities, um, AFL, which is our local sport here, Australian rules football, plays a really big part um, amongst us, especially Indigenous youth. Um, but it goes even beyond that. Like I myself, <clears throat> I found sport to be even like I'm, I'm pushing 40 now, um, sport is still a big part of my life. <clears throat> I imagine for yourself as well that sport would have been something for you. And if it was something that really helped you out, was lacrosse a sport that you actually played yourself um, during high school and college? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I suffered depression in high school and sports got me through. I was a runner and um, a downhill ski racer um, and you know, I loved the sort of camaraderie of being on a team um, and also just like pushing myself physically. I think that sports can be really helpful for youth and mental health. Yeah. Um, and so uh, so I'm I'm a big fan of, of sports and youth. I think uh, I'd never played lacrosse. I didn't know the game at all. I had to totally learn it uh, making the movie. And um, that was um, comical at times. But 
but the the this is it, it is an indigenous sport. It's a creator's game. Um, lacrosse was developed thousands of years ago and used to be pay, played by thousands of um, indigenous men out on a field. And it was actually used as a sort of medicine game to heal communities, to play a sport instead of um, instead of fighting. It was kind of used like a duel um, to kind of mend and heal communities um, and make connection. So the fact that it comes from that, um, I think is, is there's something in it that I think is healing. And um, when I talk to the young Inuit and indigenous players who play the game and, and, um, and the importance of, of it in, in their lives, uh, I think one of the things they talk about is just the physicality of it and the fact that it's a very physical sport. It's quite aggressive um, and that they were able to, when they had anger and feelings because of trauma in their past, they were able to get that out on the field. Mm. Um, and it kept them from maybe, you know, um, uh, kind of using it in, 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 inside and in inappropriate, you know, or dangerous times. So I, I really, um, I do think it's, it's healing in general sports, but I also specifically, I think this sport for the kids that talk about it, um, what it did for them, it, it was healing for them too. So for everyone out there listening, The Grizzlies out in select Australian cinemas now, um, it's a fantastic film, one of the best films of its kind that I've seen in quite a long time. And Marina de Poncio, I thank you very much for your time today and well, congratulations with the movie done. Really great work here. I can't wait to see what you've got um, in the future as well. Thank you. I'm so jealous you guys have movie theatres open and I wish I could be there.